Hello, my name is William Knoll. I'm an aquaculture consultant here at Aquabiotech Group. I'm primarily involved in RAS design, but also do general consultancy for research projects. Um, today, I'm going to be looking at uh, with you some of the RAS maintenance that we do here in Inovia, but can be applied to any RAS application. Uh, I, I know my colleagues have gone over some of the functions and routing checks of the system, so I'll try to limit this to some more commonly performed system maintenance and checks uh, and management practices. Uh, but I'll also go over some background on the, the equipment and um, design uh, considerations when selecting the, the components. Uh, throughout the presentation, we have some video demonstrations of the maintenance procedures just to help with uh, visual aid. Uh, first off, we'll be looking at tank maintenance. Um, I'll start going over some of the design and management considerations we, we take into account when selecting or designing our tanks for the systems. Um, some important things that we want to consider or aim for are um, homogeneous water quality, so even distribution of oxygenation and flows, um, even distribution of the fish throughout the water, you don't want issues with fish clumping in a corner or at the base of your tank. It needs to suit the species. Um, you also want a, a low maintenance design. And I'll go into this more later on, but this is to do with a, a self-cleaning function, which we call it. Um, and as mentioned, the, the flow rates will need to match the, the species and life stage of the, the fish you are culturing. Um, other design considerations you might take into account is the ease of use, accessibility, and uh, the visual or automatic observation of waste and feed to enable your precise management of feeding to satiation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the self-cleaning function of the tanks is very important to us in RAS because we, we want the systems to be as low labor and maintenance as possible whilst maintaining good water quality. Um, why is this so important? Well, organic matter from excess feed, fish waste and mortalities can promote bacterial proliferation, um, including pathogens. It can increase the, the BOD within the system and deteriorate the overall water quality. So we need to get rid of those, uh, so what that waste material as quickly as possible and efficiently. Uh, the, uh, also, these three nutrients have additional issues in, in RAS. Uh, if you have excessive biofilm development, it can add to the creation of off flavor compounds in the fish, um, uh, which w will can lead to the need for increased depuration times, which can affect your production um, time frame. Uh, the, the biofilm development can also increase the friction within the pipeworks and then reducing your overall system efficiency. I mean, this, this can appear minor, but if considering the, the great lengths of pipework you have in some of these RAS, it, it can add up considerably. So this self-cleaning function of the tanks um, is primarily due to the hydraulics and flows within the tanks. Um, a properly designed tank with correct dimensioning, inlet and outlet orientation will uh, allow create this hydraulic self-cleaning, meaning that there's strong secondary flows along the base of the tank to push solids to the drain, uh, typically between 15 and 30 centimeters a second of flow along the base. Um, ad additionally, a, a smooth lining of the tanks will uh, assist with this by reducing friction. Uh, this, these flows um, aren't always suitable though or achievable uh, based off the species uh, or life, uh, life stage of that, the species that you are culturing, uh, such, as, such as turbot or any early larvae stage sea bass bream. Um, and in these cases, you'll likely have to do manual uh, siphoning or manual cleaning of the tanks. Uh, uh, as it's shown here, one option of that is uh, siphoning. Uh, I'll demonstrate that shortly. Whilst we want these solids to be evacuated quickly, we also want to prevent the escape of fish. Uh, to do so, we need to correctly select the outlet and uh, uh, overflow sizes. Um, 
either using a mesh cover or just sizing the, the holes or slits within these overflows correctly. Uh, undersizing can lead to clogging with solids or mortalities and um, ideally you would have a selection to suit the size and feed that you are putting into the system. So here we have a short video on some tank maintenance. Here we have a tank set up in Anovia. Um, these are juvenile seat mass. You can see the mesh covers and the standpipes there. Uh, these are some standpipes designs we have available. Uh, these can be easily custom built. Uh, these holes in the top are important for letting air flow, uh, preventing a vacuum, letting the water flow. Uh, this is a cheaper alternative, just anything to allow the airflow whilst preventing any fish jumping in there. Uh, for smaller fish, as mentioned, you can uh, use a mesh cover, uh, simply cut to size and secure with a cable tie. <coughs> Uh, similar concept to the overflows, uh, you want to select them based off the size of the fish, uh, not so much pellets for these. Um, and for smaller fish, again, you can cover up with uh, mesh to uh, prevent escape, simply secure for cable tie or several. Uh, so here is the spray bar for the tank. This is for directing the flow and uh, injecting water at depth. Uh, so to redirect, simply unscrew, you don't have to fully take it off, but uh, unscrew, redirect in the direction you want and uh, screw it back on just to make sure that it's checked the flow in the tanks. Um, so here we have a demonstration of the hydraulic self-cleaning. You can see the vortex effect created drawing the pellets towards the centre. Um, but here you also can see the pellets accumulating for a standpipe that's not been sized correctly. So. Uh, to get rid of that, we would use a siphon. So to secure the end of the siphon so there's no uh, air coming in, uh, pump to prime the siphon, ensure there's a steady flow, and uh, then we can simply hoover up the uh, feed or any waste that you see within the tanks. Uh, different siphons will have different attachments. Uh, for, for larvae fish, this wouldn't be suitable as it would just suck them up. So you would need a, a, a cover and then when you're done, simply uh, draw out the siphon to cancel the effect. Here we can see the uh, pellets that we accumulated. It's quite effective. Um, for some tanks uh, with reduced velocity, uh, we'll have fine solids like this settling, and they will just need to be resuspended or pushed towards the centre drain. Uh, when you're using any brushes like that, just make sure they're disinfected. Same for nets. Uh, this is the high pressure snake device we use for cleaning inside the pipework. Uh, this isn't necessarily routine, but would be performed between trials or production cycles when you're trying to reset your system for biosecurity purposes. Uh, this is generally just done with water here to dislodge any biofouling, but disinfectant can be used. Uh, this was actually being performed by two people, one operating the pressure and one inserting the snake, but you can manage it yourself. Uh, some systems have access ports such as this, uh, where you can just unscrew the end and insert the snake. So one of the most important components of a RAS is the pump. Um, you can consider it the heart of the system. It's responsible for the main circulation. <clears throat> and uh, although modern pumps are very robust and low maintenance, Failure really is uh, inevitable um, if maintenance is neglected. Um, and in the long run, it is inevitable full stop. So um, se selecting the correct pump is critical. Um, the material should be suited for the application. Uh, marine systems will require corrosion resistance <coughs> material. And you also need to provide sufficient pumping capacity without being excessive and wasting power. Uh, so you need to consider all of the flows within your system, any head losses, any the, so the head requirement uh, before you select. Um, additionally, uh, although preventive maintenance is key, I always recommend having a spare pump available, ideally plumbed into your system so you can switch over at, uh, if anything goes wrong with the main pump, but alternatively one in storage that you can quickly swap over. If you have any spares in your system, I would recommend it being a main pump.
So most main circulation pumps should have a pre-filter -pre for catching large debris before reaching the impeller. This should be emptied every two weeks at the minimum, minimum uh, but every week possibly, dependent on the influx of debris or your application. Uh, issues with the pump can be to, uh, spotted through noises, uh, vibrations, reduced flow and uh, heat coming from the pump. Uh, this can be for a number of reasons such as an airlock within the pump or system, debris uh, in the housing, damaged impeller blades or low water levels of the source tank such as if you're drawing from the, the biofilter sump, if that's a reduced level it'll be causing cavitation to occur. Uh, in either case, uh, you can follow this troubleshooting procedure. Each pump will have its own procedure, but this is a general guideline. Um, as with any electrical component, ensure that it's disconnected from the power source before performing any maintenance. Uh, check that water level that I mentioned. Uh, address that elsewhere within the system if that is the problem. Uh, check that the pre-filter or the strainer is clear of any debris. Um, if you're still having issues, uh, open up, sorry, some pumps will have a drain point on them to allow for uh, removing any air or filling the pump. Some, some pumps aren't self-priming um, and will need to be filled or just to have the air released before they work. Um, so if, if, if you, do you have this on your pump, open it up and wait until you see water coming out steadily. If you're still having trouble, you can inspect the impeller by taking off the face of the pump. We'll demonstrate this in a video in a second. Um, longer term maintenance, and this is like two year maintenance, would be to properly open it up, grease uh, any gears and uh, maybe replace some of the impeller bearings. So here we have a little schematic of some of the internals of one of the main pumps that we use for our systems. <clears throat> the, key, the key components here for you are to see are the, the strainer basket and the uh, impeller here connected to the main shaft. So here we have a short video on uh, pump maintenance. This is a pump from our Novia Bays and uh, Aqua Biotech. This uh, pump is made of a technopolymer housing, sort of plastic, making it suitable for the marine application it's being used for. Here we are accessing the strainer basket of the pump. Uh, it's important to have this sort of pre-filter when drawing from the biofilter just to ensure that no pieces of biomedia enter the impeller housing. So just remove it, inspect, clean and uh, return when you're done. If any pieces do get in, we can access the pump uh, like this, just removing the screws on the face of the pump or bolts. Uh, this will vary dependent on your pump model, but it's a very similar concept. Uh, so we take off the facing, inspect the impeller for any debris or damage. If the blades are cracked or pieces missing, uh, just ensure it's rotating freely in both directions. This part can be easily replaced uh, and it's one of the spares we recommend having available. Uh, every 12 months you want to perform this sort of procedure, which is the uh, decalcification. Uh, over time pumps will develop calcification, particularly in uh, marine, warm marine systems. So just seal up one end, uh, make sure there's no leaks and then fill up from the other end. Uh, we leave this for two to three hours, uh, up to a maximum of 24 hours. So just overnight would be suitable. So heat pumps. Heat pumps require a bit of additional maintenance uh, because of the fouling that can occur within the heat exchangers and also by the heat generated by the heat eater itself or the incoming warm water it's trying to cool down. Um, the, the decalcification procedure is very similar. Uh, we have the option of swapping out the cleaning solution similarly. Um, the additional maintenance though is more just cleaning. There is more dust entering a heat pump. So we want to ensure that the air intake sides are clear of dust and that the radiator plates on the back are uh, clear as well. We'll show you this shortly. So here we have some of the heat pump setups in Anovia. Uh, these are, have a centralized location, but they are dedicated for one bay. 
So I play the video. Uh, for biosecurity reasons, we typically do not share heat pumps between systems. However, it can be applied to a top up or intake system. Uh, you don't want to be exchanging water between systems and, and unless that's your intent. Um, so here, this is a, a heat pump um, testing setup. We've been performing maintenance on the heat pump and now we're just testing to see if it can um, bring the temperature up to what we need. So within this tank, uh, excuse the video there, uh, we just simply have it connected to a submersible pump. And then as you just saw, attached to either end of the intake and outlet of the heat exchanger of the uh, heat pump. So as mentioned on the intake side, you just want to brush away any dust that you find or, and because it's a fairly long maintenance, you might find debris at the bottom, just remove whatever you can. Just clear, general clear up. Same for the cover of the intake fan, just make sure it's free of dust. So here are some of the internal components on the left there. You saw that is the main heat exchanger where water is coming in, cold or hot, coming out hot or cold. Uh, and then on the right, we have the uh, radiator plate or the, the air refrigerant exchanger, whatever you want to call it. Uh, to clean this, we use uh, two brushes, one hard, um, one soft, one like steel brush. We use this one to separate the fins like this. Uh, because they can clump together over time and then just brush away any dirt that uh, you, you can see a good amount of dust coming off there. Uh, again, similar to the circulation pumps, you for the decalcification or clearing of the insides, you can either use the pump setup you just saw, the submersible pump, or we can just cover the, the bottom end. It's not covered here, but you would cover it. Um, and then just fill up from the top with your vinegar solution or bleach, whatever you need. So onto a common problem in RAS, and that is uh, airlocks. A uh, uh, sign of an airlock would be a reduced or unsteady flow rate within your system. And they can commonly occur when you're starting up a system, uh, filling it with water, uh, because all that air can be trapped at first, and also if you've had to drain the system. Um, typically, these will occur at a high point in the system or at a air injection point, so at a cone. Um, so this is where we try to position our air release valves. As you can see here in the picture, this is one at a high point in Inovia, and you'll see one at a cone later on. Uh, you won't always have airlocks at a point of release. Um, they can be found anywhere within the system. Uh, to get rid of them, you just try to force more water through that point, uh, either by directing more of the water flow through where the airlock is or by ramping up the pump through the VFD. If you are letting water out of through the cone or air injection point, then just um, be considerate of your biosecurity or any electric electrical components as that water can come shooting out. So just be wary of that. So here we have a typical RAS. Um, and as mentioned with most systems, we have this air release valve at a high point in the pipe work. In this case, we have the, part, the valve partially open to ensure constant release of air. You can see it's connected with a hose to direct the water back to the clean sump. Uh, this is not always suitable, however, some prep systems are pressurized. Um, as mentioned, airlocks can also form at the point of a gas injection into a system, such as, as at this cone. Here we can release the air either through a dedicated release valve or removing the gas supply, uh, ensuring that it's off first and allowing the air to release until a constant flow is seen. As mentioned, be wary of where this flow is going for your biosecurity reasons. Alternatively, if this doesn't work, we can use the pump control panel to momentarily ramp the pump up to try and force the air out. If successful, you might see bubbles coming out of the tank inlets or spray bars. Uh, this might be your first course of action. However, some trials or species are sensitive to flow changes and uh, they sh it sh should be your last option. So that depends on your situation. So moving on to biofilters. Uh, there are several types of biofilters. You have a fixed film, moving bed, aerobic, anaerobic, each with their own function and benefits. In our RAS design, we typically use uh, 
MBBRs or moving bed biofilm reactors um, to control the ammonia levels with our, within our systems. Um, looking at biofilter maintenance, the, the, the main part of biofilter maintenance is water quality management, uh, which is based off the activity of the nitrifying bacteria. Uh, when converting the ammonia to nitrate, they consume oxygen and alkalinity, so we need to ensure we provide alkalinity and oxygen for this. Um, between large feeding or if you're going through a starvation uh, period, then you might want to be adding ammonia just to keep that bacteria alive as well. Um, additionally, minimizing organic load is important to uh, reduce the development of non-nitrifying bacteria, um, which will outcompete the nitrifying bacteria. This is why we have our solids filtration, such as a drum filter just before the biofilter to remove as many solids as we can. Um, you see this picture is a, a clean sump on the left of the biofilter. Um, this is quite a small and, and new biofilter. Uh, so some of the issues you might find is a uh, fouling on the mesh, which means a reduced flow from the dirty to the clean sump. Um, if you see a difference between water levels of about two centimeters, then you might want to take a, a light brush and just clear away some of this fouling. Additionally, if you see a reduction in the aeration, even though the, the blower is working at the same capacity, then you might have fouling on the air grid within the biofilter. Uh, so you would want to remove the grid and just clear away any fouling and then place it back evenly, which is quite important so that it doesn't uh, become lopsided and then just restart the system. So now we have a video about some biofilter maintenance. Uh, this is one of our typical uh, MBBR setups. You can see the water here coming in from the uh, drum filter. This is a clean sump which has a protein skimmer loop feeding into it. Within this clean sump you'll find the probes for the system. <coughs> here we have the brush for cleaning the uh, divider mesh. Just make sure it's a soft brush. Right, straightforward. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, the, the air grid can become clogged. Uh, here we have an example of this. Um, so when removing the air grid, just ensure that the aeration, air supply is switched off. Here we're waiting for the, the aeration to stop. And then remove the air grid. You can see there's quite a bit of fouling on this one. Um, here we're also disconnecting the weights that hold it down. Uh, some might be self-weighted. Just be sure to collect all these cable ties or any, any waste that gets into the biofilter. Uh, once removed, uh, the grid can be pressure washed to remove any fouling. Just uh, get all around it and that's about it. So here's a brief slide on startup of the biofilter and some strategies and tips for speeding that up. Uh, having a quick startup can be important for meeting production targets if you're between cycles, uh, also meeting trial deadlines. Uh, we have to restart our biofilters between every trial in ANOVIA. So here are some tips for you to have a look. So a critical part of biofilter maintenance and brass maintenance in general is water quality testing. Um, here we'll be demonstrating two of the most important variables for biofilter maintenance, and that's ammonia and KH testing. Uh, these are commonly available test kits. I'll start that. Uh, however, follow the instructions on whatever test kits you have available. For both of these tests, you'll be needing five mil of system water. Uh, for these ammonia test kits, we have two uh, solution bottles to be used in sequence. Uh, so each requiring eight drops. So we measure out five mil. So I'll jump ahead a bit here. And then we add in our eight drops of solution. So give that a mix. And then we add eight drops of the other solution. Again, give it a gentle mix. Uh, don't be shaking it. And then uh, we leave that to change for five minutes. So five minutes later, we have a look and uh, compare it to the color chart. We have two color charts, one for salt water, one for fresh water, choose the appropriate one. 
So, I mean, the, compare our samples against the chart. So here we can see between one and two milligrams of ammonia. Our next test is for the KH or hardness. Again, measuring out five mil of system water. For this test, we just keep adding one drop at a time, mixing after each drop until we see a clear color change from blue to yellow. Uh, so that's three drops, five, seven, uh, that's nine. So there, we see the clear color change to yellow on the 10th drop, and that means we have a system KH of 10, which is fine. And that wouldn't need any bicarbonate addition. So on to air blowers. Um, we have many types of air blowers to choose from for uh, RAS, depending on the application from uh, rotary screw or lobe blowers, diaphragm, regenerative blowers, uh, some are high pressure for injecting air at depth, for example, for your biofilter, and some are high flow for extraction, such as in your degassing towers. Uh, these can either be centralized and shared between systems as there is no water exchange involved, uh, or you can have individual, individual blowers for each RAS. So these air blowers are critical for the uh, mixing and oxygenation of the MVBRs within the RAS. Um, they are also essential, as mentioned, for the extraction of air through degassing towers, um, providing that counter current of air and just removing the CO2 from the premises. Uh, below, we have a procedure for um, maintenance on some of the smaller blowers um, we use in our systems. Uh, these are around 120 to 160 litre per minute blowers. Uh, the Capacity can range considerably depending on the size of your system. Um, I'll leave you to pause and give that a read if you like, but we will go over the cleaning procedure or maintenance procedure in a video in a second. So here we are performing maintenance on one of the air blowers from our Innovia systems. Uh, this model is a 120 liter per minute aeration. Uh, when you're selecting the blower for your system, there is a general rule of thumb that we use that the uh, airflow volume you need is around four times your biofilter volume, so, and that's per hour. So if uh, you have a three cube biofilter, you'll need around 12 cubes an hour of aeration. So I'll give us a play. <coughs> Do you see that? 120 liter per minute. So uh, one of your main bits of maintenance uh, is uh, cleaning the air filter for the blower. For this model, we uh, remove the lid. That's it stuck in the lid there. This one's quite dirty, it's been used for a while. Uh, you give it a clean with um, some alcohol or water, give it a squeeze until it runs clean, clean the, the housing for the filter and uh, replace it. If it's uh, really bad and deteriorated, you can replace it with a new one, but they are, they are generally really reusable. Uh, return it when you're done. Uh, as with uh, all these uh, tutorials, you should uh, follow the instruction manuals for the, the blowers that you buy, uh, but the general co concepts do transfer. Uh, most air blowers will have a intake filter, and uh, depending on the type, a, a, a diaphragm, as we'll, we'll show in a second. So once you're done, return the lid. Uh, to access the diaphragm on this model, we have to uh, open it up from the base of the blower, and then to remove the cover to show the inner workings. Uh, the diaphragm is behind that uh, white housing on the front there, so we need to remove that as well. There we are. Uh, once exposed, you can see the, uh, the diaphragm and inspect it for any damage or wear. Um, this is a replaceable part and it's recommended to do so if you see any damage. But if not, just give it a clean and replace the facing. And here are my contact details and the company details if you would wish to contact us. Thanks again.